Apple Bank is coming. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, Apple's latest expansion into the banking industry by partnering with Goldman Sachs to offer high-yield savings accounts now could pave the way for what would be a first of its kind, an Apple-backed bank. We're going to make the case of why, during the next financial crisis, we could see the rise of corporate-backed banks. Plus, the ongoing battle between Speaker Kevin McCartney and President Joe Biden over the budget deficit is sending jitters into the bond market. We'll explain why and what's going on there. Plus, the recent expansion of China's economy as it comes out of hibernation from the COVID lockdowns is now sending a sigh of relief among investors that growth and inflation is back. However, one commodity says, not so quick, we're not buying it. Let's over to Bloomberg. We picked today's story up with a headline. Apple Goldman Sachs debut savings account with a whopping 4.15% annual yield. And this is going to cause further problems for a lot of these small, regional, and mid-sized banks as a notion that Apple is backing up with Goldman Sachs here to offer high-yield savings accounts, particularly going after its very wealthy client base, will cause even more deposit flight and put even more stress on these banks at a time that they don't need it. The new offering will let Apple Card users earn 4.15% annual yield, more than 10 times the national average. Its account has no fees, minimum deposit, or balance requirements, and can be set up right easily within the wallet app. And this is what's going to be getting, and what I want to make the suggestion to you, is that in the future, particularly during the next crisis, when we are likely going to see even more bank failures, the Fed, the U.S. Treasury, and everyone attempt to run to their rescue, what's going to stand ahead of this is corporations coming in like Apple, who are entering and have been entering the financial services industry to say, hey, you know what? What? We can come in, we can buy a bank, and we can back it, and you can watch. Customers will love this notion because if you think about the banking industry now, what do you have is you have banks that are backed. Of course, they have deposits, and those deposits are backed by loans and treasury securities. But could you imagine a day when the bank isn't just backed by those things, but backed by the corporate profits of its parent company? Well, I think that's coming soon. Apple announced the product in October as part of a new series of financial offerings. The idea is to generate more revenue from services, which have already surged in recent years, and provide yet another way to lock consumers into Apple's platform. Of course, it also will give Apple some insight into who has money, who to run ads to, what services they can provide, and other ways to sell their customer base as they gain more and more data. And of course, we know that there's one group that has more data on anybody in the U.S., and that's the banks. And you can better believe Apple wants to know a whole lot more because that kind of information is very profitable. Still pushing into the industry hasn't always gone smoothly. A buy now, pay later service suffered a long delay before beginning to roll out last month, and the savings account itself took about six months to appear after the announcement. The Apple Card program is also only available in the U.S. We'll say that for now. So you think about, you know, Apple's buy now, pay later. Of course, that is a debt. And if you're having debt created, well, what do you need to back that? Well, you need some assets so you can lend even more money out. So this makes perfect sense sense that Apple would make this move, but the next big move, I think, for them is to actually go into the banking industry itself by launching Apple Bank. Let's continue. The maximum balance for these accounts will be a quarter million dollars, and you think about why that's so smart, because, yo, you've got it right, it stays right at that FDIC limit, keeps Apple from having any broad exposure that its competitors will, and says, hey, you can come here, because even if we have a problem, well, the FDIC's got you too. And our goal is to build tools that help users lead healthier financial lives. This according to the Vice President of Apple Pay and Apple Wallet. And no doubt one of the easiest things for the company to do next is to open checking accounts. It's right through their phone, right through their app. The question then is, how would Apple get into the banking industry? Well, one, they could continue their partnership with Goldman Sachs, who may remember they had problems with their Marcus offering. They've sold some of that off recently, as we learned in their recent 
filings, but for Apple and other corporations, could you imagine during the next financial crisis as banks are starting to fail and they're selling for pennies on the dollar, how easy it would be for a company with the cash resources of Apple to step in and swoop it up? Well, if you don't think that's possible, it can happen. The company has generated almost 20% of its revenue from services last year, up for about 8% a decade earlier, and more offerings are coming. An iPhone subscription program is in the works, along with an expanded version of the Pay Later program called Apple Pay Monthly Installments that can handle larger transactions over longer periods while charging interest. And so all of a sudden you see indeed that Apple will want more and more money. Of course, with a quarter million dollar limit on these uh, deposit accounts, well, that's not, may not be enough. But if you think about it from a corporate standpoint, you know, you look at a bank, right? They have customer deposits, which they lend against. Well, imagine this, we know that Apple borrows money from the public markets. So what if they started borrowing from their own customers and built out their own internal bond portfolio, which they could very easily do and mimic exactly what a bank does, but except being, being backed by, of course, all the people who are borrowing the money, it's backed by Apple's cash flow, which many people would have far more confidence in than they would their bank. And I think what we start to see now is Apple making the move to launch an online bank. They'll do it by buying some other bank that is failing, and that will open the door for strong corporations like Apple to get into the banking industry. And that will help key alleviate the issue the Fed and the government has with all these banking problems or maybe it will cause even more problems as corporations get involved. What do you think? Do you think Apple is the first to launch a bank? Do you think we'll see corporate backed banks or does the Fed and the government have something else up their sleeves during the next pandemic? Weigh in in the comments. Let's continue on because now uh, Kevin McCartney pledges vote on U.S. debt limit with spending cuts, and this is causing major problems in the bond market. But he notes, and this is always the case, defaulting on our debt is not an option, he said in a recent speech, but a no-strings-attached debt limit increase will not pass, he says. And this is always the concern is, well, what if we don't pass an increase in the debt ceiling, the U.S. government will default, and then what will you see that as we get closer and closer to the deadline, you'll see see you know the fed chief come out and say hey we, we got this we're not going to let this happen you'll see a treasury secretary come out and i'm not and i'm not naming names because this is throughout history we always see this happen is as we approach these debt ceilings everybody starts to get nervous but notably we've never defaulted on our debt and that's not likely to happen here but let's get into what's going on in the bond market why it's so nervous and why perhaps there's a motivation for speaker mccartney and house republicans to drive this all the way to the deadline, whereas uh, on the opposite side, President Biden and Democrats, they don't want this at all. They want it to be resolved today. While broader financial markets so far are showing little sign of alarm that Congress and the White House won't be able to reach a deal, money market investors are already showing an unwillingness to hold paper maturing around riskier dates in the T-bill market. Three-month bills sold Monday 5.08%, the highest yield since January of 2001. And so the question you might be wondering is, why would investors be nervous? Well, it's very simple, because if the government were to default, it means they wouldn't get paid, or at least not until the ceiling was raised. And that is what's making a lot of these money market and short-term interest rate funds highly nervous and wanting to get out of those positions and not get trapped. But McCartney and Biden had met February 1st to discuss the limit, but have been a stalemate since then. Of course, we know President Biden wants to separate, of course, the raising the debt ceiling and the budget talks and get the debt ceiling problem done immediately. Can't blame him for wanting to do that. Republicans are saying not a chance. We're tying these things two together and for good reason, because this is all about power in Washington, with each demanding the other make the next move. McCartney set up Monday again. He called Biden to meet to discuss the issue. But yet Republicans haven't offered a budget plan that would lay out specifics of where the spending cuts would fall, which President Biden has called them out to do. White House Deputy Press Secretary Andrew Bates said, accused McCartney and the GOP of holding the full faith and credit of the United States hostage. Of course, what we know is this will just run down to the limit as always, put a lot of stress on financial markets. And then of course, at the last minute, something will happen. But what's the motivation here, you ask? 
Well, McCartney and House Republicans have drawn up a wish list of spending cuts, along with limits on future spending in exchange for suspending the debt ceiling for a year, which would put the next big showdown right in the middle of the 2024 campaign for Congress and the White House. Of course, you can imagine the Republicans at this point would hope to increase their power base and lock this thing down during the election and hope to get to the uh, office of the presidency that way. On the other hand, you look at the other side of the story is they're not saying where they want to cut, and that could have big ramifications for government spending. But the question is, what do you think? Do you think the House Republicans are right should stand their line here and say hey you know what we're going to get some spending cuts in and in exchange you get the debt ceiling limit raised or do you think they should separate these two just raise the debt ceiling and then negotiate out about spending cuts from there now let's take a look over at china which appears to be coming surging out of its covid lockdown but again as i said in the beginning one commodity is saying not so quick China's consumers give economy a post-COVID boost as Beijing's National Bureau of Statistics said on Tuesday that the economy grew by 4.5% in the first three months of the year when compared to a year earlier, the fastest such growth since the first quarter of 2022 and a marked improvement from the 2.9% rate in the last three months, this according to the Wall Street Journal. Now, I want to note that you know 4.5% growth rate, at least here in the U.S., would be Phenomenal. If we could average that going forward, that would be fantastic. Now, for China, it's obviously below trend, but keep in mind, as the chart shows here, they were kind of shut down. So, this is a fantastic number. Of course, you always have to wonder if what data comes out of Beijing is real or not. But what most struck many economies about Tuesday's data was the source of its growth. It was driven in large part by retail sales, which jumped a whopping 10% in March from a year earlier. That was the fastest pace in nearly two years and helped offset a sharper than expected slowdown in real estate, infrastructure, and other private spending or private sector investments, suggesting that if for some reason retail sales were to drop off or consumers were start to get nervous, so I'm going to make the case for in a moment that perhaps the rest of the economy is saying something else here is wrong. And some economists remain cautious, pointing out that the overall recovery remains nascent with several persistent headwinds. March's snapback in export growth may be short-lived if the boost from backlog orders tapers off, as expected, and recession risks continue to loom over Western economies. And this is something, of course, Chinese consumers will see long before we do here in the U.S. as a slowdown in demand means their factories will not be humming along as they need and jobs will get more difficult. In fact, the unemployment rate among young Chinese is very, very high, suggesting that underneath this headline retail sales number, which we could just cite as pent up demand, is a very, very overall weak economy, which is just validating what we know, and that is the global economy is indeed slowing down. And if we see the Chinese people start to cut back their spending and hold on to their savings, well, then we'll know for sure something is wrong. And one spot is telling us it is with this headline here, oil slips on an economy woes despite upbeat China data. Now, I want to present to you that if indeed what we're seeing in China was real, we expect a strong response out of the oil market because we know that China is one of the world's largest consumers of petroleum. But so far, we're not seeing that. The next step may depend on global growth and whether the economy can weather the recent storm, particularly in the U.S., where tighter credit could significantly weigh on growth. Could. It is for the rest of the year. Early in the session, oil had found support from figures showing China's economy grew by a faster than expected 4.5% in the first quarter, and that oil refinery throughput rose to record levels in March. And yet, what do we see here? Oil coming up to around its 200-day moving average into the low 80s, and starting to head lower, not something you would expect in the, one of the leading indicators of the market to respond if the world's investors and the economy was validating what we're seeing in China is going to push through to the rest of the world and lead to a source of growth. Oil market saying not a chance here. We're not buying this at all. And now we turn to the U.S. data today, which says, hey, problems here are starting to get worse. 
A single family building and permits jump as Renner Nation fades. Here after February surprise surge in housing starts and permits, this from Zero Hedge, driven largely by a brief dip in mortgage rates. The housing market's data was expected to slide significantly in March, released today, and they did. Housing starts fell minus 0.5%. Building permits plunged a whopping 8.8% month over month. And remember, folks, what I want to suggest to you as well, where building permits go, housing starts follow, housing completions follow that. And with that, of course, one of the last things from this chart from Zero Hedge is employment in the construction, uh, construction and residential building business starts to fall. And this is a problem because housing is a big part of the U.S. economy. And when it goes, well, the rest of the economy will follow. And I think that paves the way for Apple to eventually start its Apple back bank as stress further stress hits the regional banks, creating opportunities for big corporations like Apple to start out and be one of the first big corporate banks. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.